This is problem 10-15. It's on page 594. Refrigerant 134A is used as the working fluid in a simple ideal ranking cycle which operates the boiler at 1400 kilopascals and the condenser at 10 degrees Celsius. The mixture at the exit of the turbine has a quality of 98%. Determine the turbine inlet temperature, the cycle thermal efficiency, and the back work ratio of this cycle. Okay, now does R134A sound like a strange fluid to use for ranking cycle? Well, most of the time when we talk about ranking cycle, we talk about using steam in a power plant. R134A boils at a much lower temperature, for example, than water. So what can we use an R134A system for? I mean, usually R134A is a refrigerator, so if we tried to use it in a turbine and to generate power, probably we were dealing with temperatures that are much lower than we would normally expect, right? Anyway, let's see what happens. So R134A is the working fluid. We know that, well, first of all, Let's draw the TS diagram. Do you know what the TS diagram would look like for the ranking cycle? You should have it marked in your book by now, right? What page is it? <coughs> it involves a vapor dome. Why does it involve a vapor dome? Because in the ranking cycle, the working fluid goes back and forth between liquid and vapor, right? So it's going to evaporate. It looks something like this. Cheat a little bit. This is state one. There's state two. State three is up here. And state four is actually down here. You'll notice that I started to put it on the saturated line. Why did I move it off? Because we were told that the quality is 98%, right? So it's not all all vapor, I almost said steam, it's not all vapor, but it's mainly vapor. So basically what they've told us is that, let's see, where do I want to put this stuff? The quality in state four is 98%. They told us that the pressure, where, I'm going to read it again quickly. They said that the pressure of the boiler is 1400 kilopascals. What state does that go with? <coughs> And state three, right? Because remember, state two to state three, that's where heat addition occurs. Okay, and that occurs in the boiler. So really they gave us P2 equal P3 equal 1400 kilopascals. They told us something else. They told us the condenser temperature. Well, that's down here, right? That's the 10 degrees Celsius. So state one and state four are both at 10 degrees Celsius. How do we know they're both at 10 degrees Celsius? <clears throat> it's a horizontal line. Horizontal line, right? That's the ideal. Now, in the real system, would it be a horizontal line? Well, there'd actually be a little bit of pressure loss through the condenser. But for our purposes, the pressure loss through the condenser is much smaller than the pressure loss across the turbine, if you want to call it the pressure loss, the pressure drop. Okay? All right. What else did they tell us? Uh, it's simple, it's ideal ranking cycle. And we're supposed to find some things. We're supposed to find the uh, temperature at the inlet of the turbine, cycle thermal efficiency, and back work ratio. What temperature are they asking us to find? T3. T3. That's the inlet to the turbine is T3. Right? So they want to know T3. They want to know the thermal efficiency of the cycle. And they want to know the back work ratio. What would they mean by a back work ratio? Well, think of it, about it this way. Um, I have a friend who drives for Lyft. Okay? Now, this friend the other day just made enough money to fill the gas tank. Okay? Now, that's not filling the gas tank for the amount of runs that they made that day, but it's just to fill the gas tank. Now, they'll be able to use the gas to make more Lyft runs and make more money. Okay? We could talk about the back work ratio there in the sense of how much do they make versus how much of that has to go back into paying for gas. And of course, gas is not the only thing. There'd be insurance and car maintenance and car, you know, loss in value from driving it and so on. But the idea behind back work is similar. How much do we get out or what fraction of what we get out has to go back into work to drive the pump and 
pressure. Right? That's the idea of back force. Okay, so it's just a percentage. All right, so how are we going to do this? What do we have to do? Well, normally, again, in a cycle, even in the ranking cycle, what you do is you go around the entire cycle, you solve all the states, and then you get your answer. What states are already solved? One and four are really already solved, right? In fact, one and four, we know the temperature. Could we know the pressure of states one and four? How would we do that? Not isotropic, it's easier than that. Saturation. It's saturation, right? So we've got the saturation temperature. All we have to do is look up the saturation pressure. So let's just look up P1 equals P4 equals P sat at 10 degrees Celsius. So make sure you go to the R134A tables, not the um, steam tables. You get used to working with steam tables so much in the routine cycle. You might make the mistake of going to the steam table by default. So go to 10 degrees Celsius, R134A, and tell me what the temperature is at states, I'm sorry, the pressure at states one and four. Four fourteen point eight nine. Four fourteen point eight nine. Anyone second that? I don't have it on my sheet because it won't be all that critical for our particular problem here, but if anyone seconds that, then I assume we've got the right number. Okay. So that gives us the pressure and the temperature state one and four. It turns out the temperature is really what we need. But if we're interested in how much work it takes to go from state one to state two, now we've got the pressure at state two as well as the pressure at state one. In one, fact, is that how you look up the pressure? What he did is we realized that since we know the temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, and that's a saturation temperature, how do we know it's a saturation? Because we've got a mixture of vapor and liquid. Then we can look up the saturation pressure at 10 degrees Celsius, and we've got it. So that's, that's this bit right here. Good question. Please ask those things if you have. Now, we'd like to find the temperature at state 3. We don't know how much heat is transferred in. If we knew how much heat was transferred in, we might be able to look up the uh, enthalpy at state 2, the enthalpy at state 3, calculated from Qn, and find the temperature at state 3. But that's not going to work for us. What else could we do? Is there another state besides one where we know all the information about it? We know 4, don't we? Couldn't we move from state 4 to state 3? What would be the relationship between 4 and 3? Someone said it a few seconds ago. It's isentropic, isn't it? So there's an isentropic relationship. S3 is equal to S4. So let's move, I'm sorry, yeah, that's right. <laughs> let's move from state 4 to state 3 with this idea that the entropies are the same. So what is, it, what is the entropy in state 4? We claim it's solved. Well, solved in a thermodynamic sense doesn't necessarily mean solved in a student sense, okay? <laughs> we still have a little bit of work to do. <clears throat> the entropy in state 4 could be calculated. Is it 0.98 times this FG? You got it, right. SF plus, uh, plus 98% of SFG. In other words, we're pretty darn close to SG. Okay. Does everybody understand what this means here? How would you write SFG? Let's say that it was not a number in your book. How would you come up with it? Yeah, between the gas and the Right, the difference between the gas. And the liquid. That's all SFG is, right? Look what happens. Let's say the quality was 100%. Okay, if the quality was 100%, then basically you'd have 1SG minus 1SF, and the SFs would cancel. And the entropy would simply be SG because it's all gas, right? So all this is doing is giving us percent. Let's say that it's 0%. What's all this up? So this is just basically like how far along are we? Well, we're 98% of the way to all vapor, and so we just need a 98% quality. Okay. So I want you to look up SF and SFG. Let's see if you can find those numbers. In fact, I'm going to need a little more space. Move that over. How would we find SF and SFG? Oh, we're here. <coughs> Remember when you looked up the pressure at 10 degrees Celsius? We're going to be on that same exact line because we just need properties at these saturation conditions. So help me. What is SF? 
I got point two five two eight six seven. Yes. Wrong. And what are the units? Okay, kilojoules per kilogram per kelvin. Now, really, the way I like to say it is, it's kilojoules per kelvin because that's the entropy per kilogram, so that it's a specific property. So you hear me say that a lot. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just saying it's entropy per mass. That's all I'm really saying. I'm not going to write it in here because obviously I'd run out of space. Okay, we'll just tack it on at the end. So plus 98%. Notice they've got SFG in there for us, which is really nice. What's that number? 0.67356. That's not off the video. Good. 67356. Okay. When you plug all that in your calculator, you find that's about 0.91295 kilojoules per kelvin per kilogram. See how that's the same thing as what they've got? They write it like this. They write it like this. Kilojoules per kilogram per kelvin. But that's the same thing. Okay, and I like to write it this way because really then it's entropy per, per mass. Okay? So don't get confused about it. There's the entropy in state four. Why did we find the entropy in state four? Who cares? Because now we know. Exactly. Now we know the entropy in state three. Okay? So this helped us go to state three. The entropy in state three is 0 0.91295 kilojoules per kelvin per kilogram. Now, to solve a state, you need two pieces of information. Do we know any other property for state three? Entropy. We know the pressure, that's right. So we can take the pressure, which is known, combined with the entropy, or the specific entropy, which is known, and hopefully find out the temperature in state three. Okay, so let's try to do that. So where would we do that? Well, let me teach you something very important. You don't know at this, well, let me ask you a question. This will help you learn. Should we go to the saturated or superheated tables? One for saturated, one for superheated. Give me your arguments for saturated. I mean for superheated. Yeah, it's going to be. Because it's gonna, how do you know it's going to be? Because uh, I don't think the cycle will work if it wasn't. Because it's right there, right? It's outside of that. It's the ideal. So probably it's going to, I mean, this would have to be pretty low quality for it to end up inside there, right? So tell me why you think we should go to saturate. So you can check the pressure and max temperature for it to be uh, saturated. Exactly. To find out for sure if it's saturated or not. Both of you are right. Okay. You knew it was going to be superheated. You said, let's check. Okay, let's go to the saturated tables first, and we'll check. We will end up superheated. So the saturated table, what, what, where would we go in the saturated tables? Would we go to the pressure or the temperature tables? Well, we would go to the pressure. Why would we go to the pressure table? Because we had the pressure. We got the pressure, that's right. We don't know the temperature of state three. We were down here when we knew the temperature. Now we're up here. We know the pressure up here. So look up the pressure of 1,400 kilopascals for R134A. Is there a line for that? Yes. Okay. Now look at the entropy. 0.9105 is SG. It's the bigger one, right? That's less than this. Since this entropy is bigger than the most it could be and still be saturated, it must be superheated. It's important to remember that most of the time if the properties are greater than SG, it's superheated. If they're less than SF, it's saturated. There's one case where that doesn't work out. It's the pressure case. Okay, so if you're in the temperature table looking at pressures, pressure works the opposite way of all the other properties. Okay, anyway, so let's go on. So now go over to the superheated tables. Look up a pressure of 1.4 megapascals is probably the way they've got it in there. I think they've got it. Don't they have megapascals in the superheated table? Yeah. So 1.4 megapascals and look for an entropy of 0.91295. It's not going to be there. We're going to have to interpolate, of course. All right. <clears throat> well, I performed the interpolation, and here's how I did it. I said 0 0.91295 minus 0.9105 divided by 0.9389 less 0.9105. Where the heck did I get all these numbers? What are they? It's just magic. It's just a difference, right? This is where we really are. 
But the data point we have, we have two data points. One is actually the saturation point, right? And the other one is the one just beyond the saturation points, the next row down, okay? So all I'm doing is interpolating between those first two rows, okay? So this is essentially a percentage of how far the entropy is between those first two rows. I'm going to multiply that by the temperature difference between those two rows. So that temperature difference is 60 minus 52.4. Okay, have I misspoken? Am I still okay? Yeah, I think fine. I'm sorry? I think you're good. Okay, all right. Okay, so then, basically, what this does is it calculates how far the temperature is from the 52.4 degrees Celsius saturation temperature. Okay, it's not quite 60, but it's close. So then we have to add 52.4, and these would all be degrees Celsius. So we'll end up with a temperature of 53.1 degrees Celsius. Now, do you think we really care about the temperature? Why or why not? <clears throat> Answer is no. Why don't we care about the temperature? Well, why would you build this in the first place? To generate power. The power generated by the turbine is going to be proportional to what? The enthalpy, right? If you know the enthalpy drop across the turbine, that'll tell you how much specific work comes out of the turbine. If you know the enthalpy rise across the pump, you know how much uh, specific work you have to put into the pump, okay? So we're more interested in enthalpy. So I also interpolated the enthalpy while I was here and got that the enthalpy was uh, 276.93 kilojoules per kilogram. Just note that's also by interpolation, okay? Well, let's write it up here because I'm going to need that board, board space. 276.93 kilojoules per kilogram. Could you guys help me find the enthalpy in state four? How would we do it? Same way we did the entropy, right? So this would be H4 equals HF plus 98% of HFG, okay? Now notice, we're not talking about superheated anymore. Now we have to go back to the saturated tables because now we're down here. Where would we go in the saturated table? Pressure or temperature table? Temperature. Temperature table, right? Because that's where we're going to find a nice round 10 degrees Celsius. Okay? So let me get rid of some of this. We'll go ahead and calculate H4. I must have done it in here somewhere. Yeah, here we go. 65.43. Uh, 3 instead of 8. I can't seem to say the number and write it at the same time. This is getting worse. 98% of HFG, which is 190.73. This comes out to 252.35 kilojoules per kilogram. See how that's a little lower than HG? Is that a surprise? No, we're not quite to the saturation point, not quite to the gas saturation point. Okay. So now we've got the enthalpy in state four. Does everybody see where I got all those numbers from? Okay, I do recommend you follow along and ask questions if you don't know where things come from. So there's the enthalpy in state 3 and the enthalpy in state 4. Okay, could we find the enthalpy in state 1? We claim that this is solved. Yeah, this is going to be really easy. You're on the right row already. Tell me, what is the enthalpy in state 1? What's another name for it? What's it called on the table? I'll give you a hint. It's on the saturated liquid line. Asia, right? That's it. I need to make this more fun. I need to make it a game. Have you guys ever played You Don't Know Jack? Video game? <laughs> Old video game. It's a lot of fun. It's amazing they could fit so many snide comments on 650 megabyte CD. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Seemed like you never ran out of insults when you got the wrong answer. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in some of the games, they would give you more and more hints as time went on, your score was going down, you eventually would get the answer. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, H, if we want the enthalpy in state one, it's just going to be HF at 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so at 10 degrees Celsius, HF is 65.43 kilojoules per kilogram and now I'm wishing that I had made the nice little table you know with all four states in it so this could be organized well but too late now. How about state two? Why would I care about the enthalpy in state two? Do I really have to solve the whole thing? Let's look ahead a little bit and decide whether or not we're going to need H2. We need to calculate the thermal efficiency. How can we calculate the thermal efficiency? What equation do you remember? 1 minus uh, Q, uh, QL over QH is 1 over TL over QH. Okay, let's, let's do TL or QL over QH and 1 minus TL over TH. Let's explore that for just a minute. Okay. Is this the thermal efficiency of this cycle? No. What is this? It's for not just isentropic, this is for a fully reversible process, or, or cycle, I'm sorry. This is not a fully reversible cycle. What cycle is fully reversible? Carnot cycle, which you learned about a little bit in 220. Probably forgot, that's okay. I kind of expect that. The Erickson cycle and the Stirling cycle. Okay, those are the three reversible cycles that we study in this class. So this isn't going to work. Could we use this to compare how we're doing? No, we couldn't, because look, see how the temperature varies from state 2 to state 3 where we're adding heat? So there's not just one temperature we can plug in here. But this does give us the general idea that the farther apart these temperatures are, the better off we'll be. Okay? So unfortunately, that won't work for us. You're on the right track, though. What else could we do? Uh, one minus Q and Q. Okay. Could we do it this way and deal with specific heat transfers? Yeah, that works. Now, where does Qn occur? In the boiler, state 2 to state 3. Okay. So from state 2 to state 3, that enthalpy change is driven by the heat addition. In other words, if I were to write an energy balance, here, let's, let's even draw it. Here's the boiler. Okay. You bring in state 2 stuff, state 3 stuff comes out comes in as a liquid here, leaves as a vapor here. We already know that, right? Look, liquid, subcooled, vapor, superheated. We know that. We put heat in. Where does that heat go? Into the flowing stream that's going through here. And what does it do? Does it add to the kinetic energy of the stream? Not significantly. We don't know anything about cross-sectional areas. We have no way to talk about that. Does it add to the potential energy? Does it raise it up in the gravity field? Even if it did, who cares? <laughs> it's such a small change, even if you raise it a thousand feet in the air, that it doesn't make a bit of difference. What it does is it increases two things. It increases the thermal energy. I'm surprised the temperature went up. And increases the flow energy. That's not a surprise either, because look, now we've got a gas flowing which has a much higher specific volume. That's one of the main reasons for having this boiler, is to get a much higher flow energy. Thermal energy is nice, but the flow energy is what really drives this thing, okay? So anyway, those two together are enthalpy. And so an energy balance around the boiler, or in our system, says Qn takes the enthalpy from state 2 to state 3. Okay, that's where that comes from. So, 1 minus... I'll leave Q out blank for a minute because I want you to tell me what to write in there. So H3 minus H2 is what I'm going to put in the denominator. What should I put in the numerator? H4 minus H1. H4 minus H1, that's right. That's where Q out occurs. Which one has more enthalpy, state 1 or state 4? State 4. State 4, right? More of its gas. And that gas has more energy, therefore has more enthalpy. Okay. All right, so yeah, we do need H2, rats. What do you know? We've got to solve the whole thing. Okay, well, let's go. What relates state one to state two? Kind of an equation. Sorry? 
<laughs> about to say something, just said, nope, that's not right, never mind. Retract those words. <laughs> constant entropy. Just like the turbine is constant entropy, the pump is isentropic. Now, we can write the pump word this way. 1 to 2 is H2 minus H1. That is true. But it's not the easiest way to do it. In the slides, I gave you another equation for the isentropic pump for isentropic pump work. Now, unfortunately, I'm thinking it may not be in the slides for chapter 10. No, I did put it in there. See how nice I am to you guys? I give you everything you need. The problem is I give you so much you're not sure how to put it all together, right? Anyway. The, the specific pump work in can be written this way, but it can also be written this way. So it's the specific volume multiplied by P2 minus P1. What specific volume? If you're pumping a liquid, does the density of that liquid change? Not significantly. It's incompressible, right? So which would be easier to find the specific volume in? State 2, where we don't know anything yet, we don't know much. Or state 1, where we know everything. Right. State 1. So help me find the specific volume in state 1. What would that be? You already helped me find one property. You helped me find H1. Okay. Table. table. What table? Saturated, Saturated table 4. R134A. Temperature or pressure? Temperature. Good. Because we want 10 degrees Celsius. So what is this? What, what do they call this in that table? Saturated liquid. Yeah. So point zero 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 seven nine three. Okay. Now I'm not going to write down. Well, maybe I will write down the units on this one. Uh, let's see. There it is. Cubic meters per kilogram. P two minus P one. So fourteen hundred. Uh, kilopascals less for 14.89 kilopascals. What kind of units will we end up with here? What's a cubic meter times a kilopascal? No, kilopascals of pressure. Hopefully you've written this down somewhere. Kilojoule. Kilojoule. There you go. There's a man that's written it down like I told him to. Okay, this is just cubic meter times kilopascal is a kilojoule. So this is kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. Now please type this in your calculator because I use this as an intermediate result. I've got it written down, I just don't have a number for it. And I'd like to have the, um, uh, just that piece, that specific word piece. 0 0.781. 0 0.781, thank you. Anyone second that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now if we want to calculate the enthalpy in state two, it would just be the specific work, the pump work. Let me just put, uh, well, no, let's not do that. Let's do that. Uh, plus the enthalpy in state one. Okay, so take this number if you've still got it in your calculator and add H one to it. What do you get for the enthalpy in state two? Sixty-six point two one. That's what I got, 66.2. So now we can calculate the thermal efficiency. Okay, now we've got all the enthalpies. Okay. Either. Is that a specific work plus H1? That, yeah, here, I'll write it down over here. H2 equals H1 plus the pump work, pump specific work. All it is is saying to get from here to here, you've got to put work into it. The number? Yes. Well, 66.21 is H2. Yeah, that's right. I don't know what the pump work was. Do a small. Yeah. In fact, I should have kept that. What was it again? 0.781. So So let's go ahead and finish up this off, calculate the thermal efficiency, 1 minus H4, there it is, 
252.35 minus H1, 65.43, divided by H3, that's 276.93 minus, let's see, H2, and that's 66.21. When you plug all that in your calculator, you get an efficiency of 11.3%. Yeah, that sounds horrible. Why is this efficiency so low? Because R1 for A is not super great bad, or is it a super low temperature? The temperature difference is not super great here. We were on the right track a minute ago when you had 1 minus TL over TH. I thought that would work. No, but the idea is still true. But the gap's not. There's the no gap's idea. not very big. Look, yeah. the maximum temperature where we're adding heat is 53.1 degrees. The low temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. That's not much difference, right? That's 43 degrees. Uh, someone was talking about a wristwatch that's powered off of the heat from your arm. Okay? Sounds cool. Sounds interesting. They're going to have low temperatures like this. Could they use R134A to drive a small ranking side? Maybe. Do they really? Probably not. They probably use a semiconductor, a Peltier cooler in reverse, basically, which would work. So it's a semiconductor. There are other inefficiencies with those, but that you can have a nice small package with it. And you don't need a whole lot of power anyway. Anyway, so 11.3% um, is not really surprised. Where could we use something like this? Is there any place where this would be useful? Actually, there are some places. Um, any place that you have a low temperature difference and relatively low temperatures, you may be able to extract some work even though there's not a high capability and not a, not a lot of potential there. Okay? We covered chapter 8, we have more terms to talk about this. There's just not much space for getting some work out of this thing. This is already ideal, and this is the ideal efficiency. The real efficiency is going to be lower than this. Okay? But, if you got a, a no-cost thermal source and no-cost thermal sink like the atmosphere, why not? Okay. You just have to use a refrigerant that's or a, refrigerant, a working fluid that's compatible with those temperatures. You're not going to boil water with that temperature, right? But you can boil R134A with that temperature. Anyway, so there's the efficiency. It's 11.3 percent at most. Now, do you think we'd be willing to pay billions of dollars for this machine? Probably not. If the government yeah. says it wants it. If the government says it wants it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. Politics continues to come up. <laughs> How about the back work ratio? What's the back work ratio? Well, the back work ratio is basically the amount of work you have to put into the pump divided by the amount of work you get out of the turbine. Now we already know that the amount of work we have to put in to the pump to just get one kilogram to flow is pretty darn low. 0.781 kilojoules is not much energy. Okay? How much work do we get out of the turbine? Well, let's calculate that separately. Now I didn't, so I'm going to need your help here. This is going to be H3 minus H4. And those numbers are 276.93 less H4 is 252.35. You can see already this is huge by comparison to that. Okay? So plug that into your calculator, please. 276.93 minus 252.35. What, about 25, 24, something like that? Yeah, 24.58. So 24.58. 5A kilojoules per kilogram. That's a pretty good payoff. You can look at this like an investment. You invest 78 cents and you get back $25. Tell me where I can find that investment, please. I'd love to do it. <laughs> I got a lot of 78 cents available. <laughs> okay. So the back work ratio is pretty good on this thing. It's basically the pump uh, work, 0.781 over the turbine work, and so that comes out to uh, 0.032. Wait a second. Why is it such a small number? Oh, well, of course, of course, yeah, of course it's 0.032. I'm thinking of the other way around. I'm thinking of return on investment instead of 
the other way. So that's 3.2%. Three, a little over 3% of the turbine's work has to go back into driving the pump. Okay. Sounds like a good trade-off to me. Questions on this problem? What was the key to this problem? When did it really open up? One was the efficiency problem was different. It was the TL and the TH, it was the... Right, so the efficiency is different, but when did it kind of just fall out? Everything just fell into place. It was pretty easy after that point. Solve for the states, right? Once we solve for all the emphases, everything else was just plug and chug. Okay, where students usually struggle is knowing how to use the cycle diagram to come up with the right emphases. They struggle here a lot. Okay, I hope you guys don't, because they forget how to use uh, quality to come up with properties. Or they'll forget that this point's actually in the superheated region. Or they'll forget, forget something like the pump work is V delta P. And that's where students struggle. You may want to go to the slides and write down all the equations that go with the particular cycles. It's something really handy to have. And I tried to put them all together for you. But some of the things you need to use over and over, like the pump work. And so you may write that down even on the regenerative ranking cycle, because you'll use it several times. Another option is just to write down the extra equations that are needed on the more complicated cycles. So we're going to get into cycles that have multiple passes where the working fluid goes back to the boiler then comes back to the turbine, for example, goes to, or actually goes to a different turbine, a reheat type of cycle. Okay. All right, anything else? <coughs>